A nonprofit board is there to provide strategy, direction, and structure. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I am your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and author of The Five Simple Truths of Raising Kids. This is the second episode in Talking About Kids series that uses the history of home-based youth services to examine the life cycle of nonprofits, from founding through hardships and into maturity. My guest this episode to discuss the role of a nonprofit board of directors is Neil Sutton. Neil is an entrepreneur and a serial community servant. Neil has chaired several nonprofit boards, including Homebase, which is where I really got to know Neil and respect his leadership. Neil brought Homebase through the roughest time in its history. And I'm excited for him to share with you how, and maybe more importantly, why he did it. This podcast was sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services Must Stop Bullying campaign through its Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. I put some time and activities into the church. And at that point, um, I worked with the, you know, the, the priest that you're aware, aware mm -hmm. of, and um, kind of followed that guide of saying yes, because I really wanted to change my life out of that corporate world, which almost killed mm. me, I can stay in the hospital, uh, to working in your community and living and dealing with the people around you, both as a as a social outreach, as a service outreach, and as a vocational outreach. I started my own business mm -hmm. a couple of years after that, and I've had that for 30 years. So that's where it started. <clears throat> that's where you head down that road. And uh, it started to branch out from there. And that home base came into it, and that that's a whole other story. Well, you mentioned home base, and obviously that's something that we're going to use today as a backdrop to our discussion, at least. What were your what were your first memories of home base? What did you heard about it, and what kind of drew you to it? Home base, Brad, as you recall, was a concept. Mm -hmm. It was a need looking for a solution, mm -hmm. and it became became something that was uh, indefinite until some we put legs on it. And at that point, it was still conversation. Mm -hmm and wanting to do something and people gathering together kind of a grassroots thing if you will to start it up with names that you know pat leach and uh, uh bill murray bill mm -hmm. and i still close friends um and it started like that um but it started at as a mission of the church identified uh but not secular at all mm -hmm. not secular identified there and <clears throat> From there, it, it, it uh, morphed, and of course, it couldn't get any legs. And uh, you'll recall the story about how we started with our first $76,000. Yeah. When the lady was inherited the, the money. Well, go ahead and tell that story. Well, she inherited some money, and she said, well, I feel I should give this money uh, to some, some of this money to a nonprofit. So she talked to the pastor. And um, he said, well, you, you know, you're going to have to think about it and pray on it or however you want to deal with that. Um, she did. And he came back and uh, she, he said to her, uh, what did you discern? And she said, he wants it all. And with that, she gave about $75,000, $76,000 to start home base. Yeah. And from there, we started, uh, I, I got involved from the point of view of, I was at loose ends because I left the corporate world and hadn't decided where I wanted to go <clears throat> or how I wanted to go there. So 
the leadership, which was Bill, Bill Murray at the time, who was when he was the executive director of St. Luke's, mm -hmm. uh, said, well, I need some help. Can you set up a business for me, a business plan, all the structures, all the business systems, which I did. And uh, it's not a big deal if you've been, you know, you've been in business, you know how to do those things. And finally got those set up and we had a board that was gathered. And uh, at that point, uh, I was literally not a person of, re of well known or mm -hmm. socially active or service active in Scottsdale. He said, well, so you've done all this stuff. Why don't you join the board? Which was a big blessing. Mm. And it came back to, uh, somebody told me when I uh, first joined the Catholic Church that it was a big deal when things come by to say yes. Hmm. So I said yes. It was just that simple. And quite frankly, when that board got up and rolling, it was a hugely powerful board, far above my pay grade, <laughs> social, or economic status. But it, it, it was a chance to grow, and I was one of the, the worker bees that made things, that made things happen. You know, as you recall, we first became a entity, mm -hmm. did all the legal stuff, and then we became, then we got a site mm -hmm. and had an office. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you had moved on at that time. I, I had graduated from college and moved on to graduate school. Yeah. And I think uh, our friend Dan was doing some things with us mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, he kind of moved on, but at that time we, we were able to get a space in a building to do outreach to uh, homeless youth. That was the mission. Outreach to homeless youth. Yep. Uh, homeless youth defined as between 18 and 22, predominantly kids that had either run away from home or foster kids that turn 18, <clears throat> whether in high school or where they are, they're 18 and the money stops in the foster system and they're on the street. Yeah. Well, and that's the kids we're looking for. There's a couple of things that I want to, to go to circle back to to talk a little bit about. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you in particular, um, and again, using home base, is because I think that with a lot of nonprofits, people know the founder or maybe they know the executive director, and they don't always understand what a board of directors is doing. And you, you joined home base at a really critical moment. Because up until that time, it had been two young people running around, doing a needs assessment, doing a lot of speaking, raising some money, but just kind of like yelling into the wind, hey, we need more shelters for homeless and runaway kids. They're being hurt out on the street. They're being exploited. We didn't have the term trafficked at the time, but that's what was happening to them. And we were just trying to get support. And then, but we didn't know what we were doing. We were just, we really were kids. Um, I was 19. Dan was the only adult I was friendly with at, at the ripe old age of 25. So the board comes along and really takes this idea, as you said, this concept, as you, as you called it, and made it a real thing. So in broad strokes, what does a nonprofit board do, Neil? A nonprofit board is there to provide strategy, direction, and structure. Mm. They really only have one operational purpose, and that's to hire and fire a director. Mm -hmm. uh, or, however, beyond that, they have the responsibility to provide, in my opinion, and as I've learned since nonprofits, the vision, mm -hmm. the values, the direction the oversight hmm. to get this movie. And there are steps in there. And a new board, a new board, you get your hands a little dirtier than you do on an, an older board. Mm -hmm. And we'll go into that later. But a new board uh, will really do a, get their hands uh, in the mission a little bit more uh, and in the, the guests a little bit more. But they provide all of that. And the, the bottom line on any nonprofit is funding. Hmm. They find the funding. Where do you get the money to hire the people, to do the mission, to have the facilities, to do the outreach? And that's the other function of the work. But beyond that function, there's the function of connectivity in the community. Mm. You have a responsibility not only to be loyal to the thing, 
to be passionate about the mission, but you have the responsibility also to be a connection, to be a connect, the connectivity to others in the community to foster the brand, to bring them in, if you will, bring them into the in, into the fold and if they're, if they're interested in that mission. And that is the other portion that the board has to do. There are people that can write checks. Mm -hmm. There are people that uh, can make phone calls. And there are people that do a lot of work. Mm. All of the above. Well, you And it evolves. It evolves right. from there as you get more structure in the organization and more staff. Then that board should be pulling further and further back into policy oversight and strategy. Now, you mentioned um, that that evolution of a board, and you talked about with a founding board how you get your hands a little bit dirty. It, you have a history of being on founding boards. This seems to be something. Um, I, I don't know how many boards you've served on in your lifetime. I know I've known of three that you've served on, and in two instances, these were the barest uh, of organizations when you started. These were infant organizations when you began with the board. What Home base was probably an infant organization. Yeah. That was a plank, what we refer to in the Navy as a plank owner. Yeah. <laughs> you started from zero. Yep. Yeah, I, I think we had a corporate structure and we had a bank account and we had a needs assessment. And, and that's all that we had, I think, when you joined. Um, so... What is it about the challenges? Well, first of all, describe some of the challenges of going from, you said a blanket organization or plank organization to um, something that's actually serving the population that it intends to serve. What are those challenges and, and what happens in that process? Well, I think what happens, first of all, you have to be clear about your mission. Yeah. What are you doing and clear about your mission? You have to attract people that want to fulfill that mission. Mm. You, you, you attract the supporters. When you subtract, attract the supporters, you start to attract people that will help fund that mission or are sympathetic to it. Yeah. From there, you start to grow the structure and the capacity. It's a capacity world. You can't help anybody if you're playing small. One of my favorite sta statements, and I have said this to several boards, the last one I was chair of, no, nobody served by playing small. Mm. Once we had a structure and had a couple of dollars and could hire a director, mm -hmm. et cetera, and knew we wanted to serve serve youth and have them off the streets and had a plan on how to do that mission. Uh, then we went out and found a building. And one of our board members said, you find a building, and which I did. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll get it funded. We bought a building. Well, you mentioned mission an awful lot. And... I want to talk a little bit about the importance of that mission because I think that, in my experience, a lot of nonprofits fail when everybody is committed to a dynamic founder, but less to the mission. How do you keep a board, how do you keep support for a mission when you've got a dynamic founder that is pulling attention to himself or herself? That's very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult because the founder uh, generally um, is the person who draws people in. Yeah. The people you draw in, you want dedicated to the mission, not the glory of being on the board. Yeah. It's not social. Yeah. Although it ends up, that's where you get a lot of your funding. But it, you have to be in a situation where you Define the mission carefully, and you're very careful. Um, and it's difficult for a board to handle a very strong founder. I've run into that recently, uh, where you want to make sure you don't have mission creep mm. because you can get some more money over here or over here, and suddenly you you're starting to spread out a little bit more than your original thing, and you dilute your mission. And I'm, quite frankly. You uh, lose some of your some of your structure. Yeah. It's difficult. It's very difficult uh, to say no. You got to have strong people, a very strong executive committee, mm -hmm. 
which is the people that really um, make things happen immediately and be in sync uh, with that leader. And I could be simpatico, but uh, at the same time, ensure that uh, as a responsible board member or chairman of the board, that you keep within bounds. So I was on that very first board of home base, which really wasn't a board. It was names that we had to put on a sheet to file with the Arizona Corporation Commission. And then, as you mentioned, um, we kind of, we, we were ships that passed in the night. I was heading off to grad school and, and you were joining the board and really getting things moving. And I'd stepped away, lived outside of Arizona for about 10 years. And I come back to Arizona and of course, over that time I'd visited, I'd seen the great home base buildings, the tremendous outreach vans that were out serving kids, serving kids in the street, serving kids in drop-in centers, serving them with shelter. And, and then I get asked back on the board and I was excited. And quite frankly, I, I was more excited then I was uh, smart. And as a researcher, I, I normally am pretty careful in my decisions, but I left it the chance to be back involved with this organization that um, was so important to me. And what was happening when I joined again? Neil, can you describe the, the crisis that happened uh, with the recession of the early 2000s? Yeah. That's one of my uh, greatest pains and success stories. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, we, like any other recession, even in what we're in right now, it happened very suddenly. Mm -hmm. We went from a really, really strong economy to the world falling apart. Yeah. And we won't get into the reasons we both know the planning, the reasons behind it. <clears throat> but because our our folks, we'd finished a capital campaign. We had built a new Taj Mahal building, mm -hmm. probably a little bit more than we needed, but very pretty. Um, and we'd had a lot of pledges that we were going to fulfill that, that and uh, fulfill all those pledges and pay off all those debts for the building and, and other operational things, which were done in a pretty straightforward of well audited manner. I was the auditor on the, uh, the capital campaign, so I'm pretty familiar yeah. with it. Um, and when the world fell apart, it especially fell apart in mm -hmm. Phoenix, because Phoenix was driven at that time by real yep. estate. We were growing, growing, growing. We were building out North uh, Paradise Valley, building out North Scottsdale. Tremendous building. Um, when it fell apart, a lot of people went from having a lot of money yeah. to not having anything. Yeah. A lot of people were very, very leveraged. And as a consequence, when the uh, when you're mostly privately funded, mm -hmm. uh, literally the money stops coming in. Yeah. And you've got to figure out how you're going to handle that, how you're going to shrink, how you're going to respond. And um, I think I was... Don Henniger was chairman there, and I was blessed to be the next <laughs> chair. Got to deal with that. <laughs> so I, I want to explain a couple of things to my listeners who aren't familiar, that familiar with home base, um, and also not familiar with how nonprofits are all funded. Home base was built on a covenant house model. So at the time in the 90s and the late 80s, covenant house was the one of the two kind of premier shelters for homeless and runaway youth in the United States. And they actually had a handbook, a handbook that I still own, about starting a shelter for homeless and runaway youth. And we were using it. It was our playbook. That was one in New Orleans, correct? Yeah. Well, there's one in New York City. There's one in New Orleans. We had visited the one in both. Uh, we had visited the one in New York City, went th and through all their outreach. Um, again, I was 19, I think, in an outreach van in Hell's Kitchen looking at homeless and modeling, trying to, to learn what I could about how this would apply in Phoenix. We also, they also had a, a shelter in Southern California that we, we visited and learned from. But their model was largely private support. About 
80% of their funding was private donations. 20% came from government contracts and government grants. And we've, and home base grew in that model and it worked. And there's reasons why you might want a model like that, for example, because if you have a strong enough vision and a strong enough mission, then the donors support that and you can keep them involved and connected to that mission. Whereas government funding, even though it seems more stable sometimes, is always shifting to new political needs, uh, to to new, new things that have been identified in the community. And so they're always funding different initiatives. It's sometimes, to your point, it sometimes will compromise a mission because it says, well, we're not funding homeless runway youth now. Maybe you can be this kind of organization. And that can be really hard to, to pivot, right? The government dropped transitional housing about 10 yep. years ago. Three or two or three shelters here in Phoenix went under. Yep. The other thing about it, and I'm involved in one right now, uh, called Family Promise, and we have very little government funding uh, because government funding comes with a lot of stipulations, mm -hmm. regulations, and reporting, mm -hmm. which are very, very onerous. And, and you know, the, you know the bottom line of that. You've been the chair of a, a yep. board that was with that, and that is one of the things that happens uh, when you do private funding. But the flip side of the private funding is that in a recession, in 2008 was a terrible yeah. recession. It really was. And basically, I'd say half of North Phoenix and North Scottsdale went yeah. broke. Yeah. And, and when, you're, when you are in a place like Phoenix, where real estate is so important, and the board had a lot of real, realtors on it, and they had a lot of people who were in real estate development, and a lot of their network was too, right? So, uh -huh. so then there we have this wonderful nonprofit that at that time was... You know, it, it was eighteen, almost you know, eighteen, almost twenty years old. Um, right. It was known in the community. It had a really good reputation. Um, it had received awards, and it's broke. And you did a real well. You did a couple of interesting things. Um, what? How would you describe your board leadership style? Because I'm going to describe you, but I want you to describe yourself first. I think my style is inclusive. Mm. It's inclusive and um, inclusive and compromise. Um, what, and that, well, the care and feed into volunteers means everybody gets to talk and have input. That's the biggest mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I, I try to compromise, work through things as you have to in a nonprofit board. However, what I have found is you cannot lose sight of where you have to go. Mm. You got to keep the rudder steady. Mm. And the keeping the rudder steady is always in the back of your mind while you entertain everybody's uh, everybody's ideas and literally try to accomplish through cooperation committees, uh, however you want to do a task force of what you think you need to do. Does that answer your question? It, it does. And, and now I'm going to describe for the listeners your leadership style as somebody who served on a board under you. Um, I see all of that. I would add a couple of things that you do incredibly well. So one of the things that I hoped that when I, because I modeled my board leadership a lot on you when I was chosen to be a board president. And one of the things that you did very, very well, and I've served under you know, five or six different board chairs and different organizations I've been involved in, you make a very personal connection with all the board members. So when we, when there's a crisis, you communicate directly, you pick up the phone, you talk to them. And these, that's 15 people on a board, sometimes more. And you reached out to everybody directly. And in doing that, you also communicated very, you communicated in your actions but in your words, and, and also you, you're a person that also embodies a lot of integrity. You carry that with you. But anything that you were asking the board to do was something you were doing. There was nobody on the board that was working harder than you. And the sacrifices that we had to make to keep home base going, boy, there were a couple of board meetings where I got a call before the board meeting and you said, you need to bring a check for X amount of dollars 
because we have to keep going this week. You remember we don't that. Have, I, I, I do remember that because I'm in the middle of a recession too. <laughs> I have a business, um, but I, I have so much respect for the next step that you took in keeping the kids at home base sheltered. Describe that next step that you took. It was interesting because we were obviously going to be um, going to be in severe decline. Mm -hmm. uh, we cut staff. We done we cut everything but mission. Yeah. And um, I was at the same time I was on a uh, another board uh, called Native American Connections, and they were also in the behavioral health. And then we launched a huge homeless housing project mm -hmm. while I was on that board, and I noted that they had gotten a grant for homeless youth yeah. from the government because they, they were government centric. And we all know there's more nonprofits out there than there is, than there is ability to fund them. Mm -hmm. And this was the case. We looked, started looking at who we could partner with um, to help us because obviously we needed help. And also you started to look at duplication of mission. Mm -hmm. When you had two, two nonprofits 10 blocks apart suddenly doing the same mission. And they had very strong leadership. And I literally um, asked a favor. I went out and mm. talked to their executive director and I said, this is where we are. And this is the mission we need to keep going. Mm -hmm. I see you in this mission. Would you consider a merger? Being the person she was, she said yes. And at that point, at, at that point, it uh, once you that happens, you've got a path. Yeah. Now it's really messy. The rest of it is really <laughs> messy, illegal, of uh, getting things done. But during that time, by keeping a a, a view on the mission, yeah. that what you wanted to accomplish, what you wanted to continue to accomplish, putting egos and mm -hmm. things aside, uh, you did the best solution possible for the for the population you serve. One last question for you, Neil. What is your advice for potential board members? My byword for any time you're involved with anything is nothing replaces being there. Mm. Be present. Show up. Whether it be at a board, at a wedding, at a funeral, show up. It shows commitment. Then you look at things like, is that your mission? Do you have time? Are you willing to give the uh, time and treasure? Mm -hmm. That's your job. But you've got to be there. You've got to be present. You've got to be involved. You can't just do this as a sideline and attend a meeting or two and put it on your resume. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Neil, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be on this podcast. Um, more importantly, I want to thank you, my friend, for showing up over the years. Uh, you've done so much good, and I'm very proud that you're a friend. And um, I've been very proud to, to follow you into some battles and nonprofits in the past. Thank you. We've done some fun things together, Brad. I always enjoyed your presence and always enjoyed sharing a glass of wine with you now and then. <laughs> That was Neil Sutton. For more information about Neil and Home Base Youth Services, please visit talkingaboutkids.com. My examination of the management of nonprofits continues next week when Dee Dee Yazzie Devine and I will discuss the role of managing a mature nonprofit and embedding it in a community. As always, our theme song is by the Senators. For more of their music, go to thesenatorsmusic.com. And if you like this episode or other episodes of Talking About Kids, I encourage you to subscribe and to share it with your friends and colleagues. And I also encourage you to remember that kids are young goats and young children. And the difference is that young goats are easier to manage.